thank you for uh, joining. Of course, uh, it's been a while. So um, as I was explaining before, it's it was also quite a challenge for us to organize this today because it's online and offline. And, we have, and I hope also the one uh, online here as well. Uh, but normally we have someone checking here. Uh, so excellent. Well, so I was saying that it has been a while. So we are very happy to see you all physically again. Uh, it was a uh, humanly uh, kind of a historical uh, situation, a historical precedent. So it's good to physically um, meet each other again. So what uh, have we done so far? Of course, thanks for uh, thanks to all our members, our partners, uh, sponsors for their support, as well thanks for World Hero for the uh, for hosting the event. The next event will be later, because that's very important. Um, I would just start, I would just like to make sure that we are all on the same page um, and uh, reminding everyone what is the definition of protect. That's really the European definition that was defined by European Protect Association, Protect House. So it's any innovation, it can be technological, technical or business model. So it can be very low tech uh, in the real estate value chain. So not only real estate, but as well construction. Uh, and across all the real estate asset classes. Small reminder. All right, and as a reminder, we are a community gathering all the real estate innovators with the ambition to help or to ease the digital transformation of the sector. So what we want to do is match make startups, corporates, investors, and to help the, to, to foster innovations in real estate. Right, so today we will present 117 company members. So we have a great, uh, growth rate in terms of new members and we organized uh, 28 events gathering more than 3,000 people so far so it's it's, uh, it's good to see that there is a growing appetite from the uh, real estate sector about innovation um i am right i'm you um fun fact actually to learn as a classmate back in europe for about six years ago um, Yeah, you could get three nice slides. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the point is really to explain why born was the idea behind it. So, again, the real estate sector and, and, and what done better um, before so someone wants to buy properties in real estate whatever so the first thing they do is they go on the internet and find the and you know the experience is this is one more time then we want to know the full scale of the corporate side. We want to know how much uh, they can actually know what they can do. So, how did they go about? Well, what we used to have a simulator on this website. It wasn't integrated, but the rate was just a uh, trade. It was something that was just hard to get. And so, absolutely. 
as a lead generating tool. So what do we do? We want to have a trace because we are actually providing um, the Right, so we're not looking with that time. They're really, so that's not good. So you want to go to your Mac, personally, your Mac website, and there. So, obviously, uh, it's basis rates and all these things. Um, this is not a good thing. So then your last report is so this is good with um, now we're uh but usually we don't take that anyway. So it should be on And um yeah, this is our place uh before I ask the problems in this. Uh they cannot uh learn anything we we're not sure yet here. Um and uh we're not taking a lot of time to go and see us. And then you have to negotiate with that way. So it's not good. So if the buyer or the seller maybe has several problems, so they can go to the seller and if it's getting more than two, uh, they will have to break down the survey as well. So what do you do? In case you don't break down the survey without having to pay more than the amount of the bank is going to pay for the survey. So the bank is going to pay for the survey. This was the situation back when we started the organization, and this is where we were, um, where we wanted to make life easier for our clients. So, the conclusion is that we don't want to have to it. Um, it's very difficult to know how to start and a very stressful group. Then, of course, we want to do better, and we do, right? So, since then, it's more of a creative thing, more like design. Um, is a big shot to get it before we can get to it. And then, now, what we have, the information we keep it actually will be something else. Um, what actually is easy is getting the grid in the grid in the user. That we have the grid in the user. It's easy to get a smooth balance. And it's actually the best thing that we have in the grid. So it's not a lot of mistakes. And you know from the get go that if the information is provided, this is an issue. Um, and the, the, the advantage to all these people who want to do all the key trade is that they have a whole lot of resources. They don't have to use the same key services uh, that they are for. And by integrating them on their website, the user can also save it to all these key services. Not their different relations that they use. And also, while it's a big user, obviously, you will go to the users and search. So we can maybe see the prices on the house and see what it's called. Give away with them and the key traders, and this is why we're doing it with the key trades. Um, and as I said, it's uh it's really it was for us the obvious choice to start with that. I'll leave for a little bit because I feel like it's asking to be so yeah, for us for the bank, the reason we were interested in this partnership is from the transportation because it's a traditional business and the visibility of the visibility of the website and I think it's hundred thousand. It's increasing every time we talk. Actually, more than that, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, so, this is good for them. Yeah, that was really nice as well. But more than that, there's also the fact that uh, I think all the banks, and we also are um, uh, moving from a product based uh, approach to uh, well, we will hear talking about uh, open banking ecosystems uh, a lot, but okay, that, that's 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 the truth. And that's something that we uh, that we also want to do. So instead of just 
um, offering products to consumers who really want to integrate these products in customer journeys. And when we say customer journeys, it really means end-to-end -end customer journeys, meaning we don't want to wait that people need a mortgage loan and then they have to think about us, they, they have to compare us with other banks and so on. What we try to do is to be present already at the very beginning when the people are just looking for a house. They don't even know they will need a mortgage loan. I mean, they know they will have, to, they will need one, but they didn't think about it yet. And already at that time, we want to be present and to be visible. And so that was a great opportunity to to do this partnership. And and we think Imoweb was, of course, the best partner on the market to to do that. So that was a very good thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, another question is that um, regarding the new trends of the residential uh, sector, then we we can see that there is a conflict between the ownership and the right uh, of usage. So we speak more and more about the rent to buy model, like uh, leasing in the real estate. So does uh, maybe Clifford has uh, any views on that? Um, honestly, yeah. I can't say much about that, and I absolutely didn't prepare that question. So <laughs> I should have another one. It would be my pleasure to go on. Um, recently, so, okay. recently, so several banks have been uh, closer to real estate um, transactions, like Belfus, Imovlan, uh, ING, and uh, and other partners. Um, is the residential the next big commercial battle between uh, between banks, or you want to start? Or... We'll get there. Um, yeah, we will. I'll come back to that if you don't mind later. Um, yeah, so. Uh, your question, the is it the next big commercial battle? It really goes back to the previous um, journey you mentioned. So currently, the user journey starts on the real estate platform, and that I think honestly will never change. Um, whether it is in web or you know in street or whatever, this is where it starts. You find a property, and this is this is where it starts. Then you're going to the bank to see how much you can borrow. Then you can go back to the property, to the real estate platform to see what you can actually buy. Then you go back to the bank. Then you go to the sales agreement. And then you come back to the bank and actually get the loan. So the real estate journey is really very, very long. Um, and by integrating actually um, the, um, the, the, the financing in the real estate platform, it makes the, the user journey much easier. And it's also it also allows actually to capture the user from the very beginning. And I think for it, for me, this is really key because the user can get lost in numerous, you know, amounts of banks. Uh, in a typical user uh, real estate journey, they go to and see three or four banks. But when it's integrated, what we hope to do is that the user will actually go to see one or two banks. And the point is not to get the user at any cost because we want to offer a good rate, and this is what we're trying to do with Keep Rate. Um, so this is really the yes. entry point. The real estate platform is really the entry point, and. Um, Idris mentioned uh, in his uh, uh, in his uh, in his uh, comments uh, earlier that yes, Belfius indeed uh, has integrated uh, Immoblan. Immoblan is 120,000 visits daily. Um, Immo is 600,000 daily visits, not to brag. But um, since the real estate platform is the entry point, I think this is really the crucial point that um, uh, you're, you're you're on board with um, with as much traffic as you can get. I think you said it all, so I couldn't say it better. I would have used buzzwords like uh, open banking and ecosystems. But... Thank you. Um, I see the time is, is running, but maybe a last question um, uh, to you, Thomas. Um, what about the innovation strategy of Bitred um, and the Ah, that's the only slide I prepared. Um, <laughs> so, about innovation. So actually, innovation really is, is in our blood uh, at Kitred Bank. So as I said, it was created as a, as a very innovative first online broker in Belgium. So that was something. Then in 2015, we launched the first uh, robo-advisor in um, discretionary management product. Uh, it's called Kitred. Um, that was very innovative as well. In, in 2017, when we launched Kihon, it was the only real end-to-end -end digital mortgage loan offer, um, again, pretty disruptive. And um, 
So today we need to talk about the, the, the partnership with ImaWeb, which is also something quite innovative. Um, the other little uh, points uh, are empty. Doesn't mean we are not planning to do any innovation anymore and you know, things like that. But yeah, I don't have anything to really announce yet today. What's maybe interesting is to to explain how we approach um, innovation and how we try to do it. Because of course we would like to, uh, I think like like every everyone in every bank, we would like to be the, the great innovator, to have the biggest idea, the, to be the disruptor on the market and so on. But um, we have to face it. We, we are a very small bank and we have we have budgets for, for innovation and development that are a tiny fraction. Does, I mean, other banks have dozens or sometimes even hundred times more budget than we have. So it's very difficult to really uh, be there and, and find the, the ideas and be the, the first mover. So uh, what we try to do is rather to be um, a fast challenger. So, you know, in, in innovation strategy, you always talk about the, the early birds, first movers, uh, fast followers and so on. We don't want to be fast followers. We want to be fast challengers. It means we are always screening the market to see what, what innovations are, are coming. We discuss with a lot of fintechs uh, trying to be in, in these networks all the time. And when we spot interesting uh, opportunities, we really try to see, okay, what's the added value for the client? Is it worth it? Um, can we improve it? And, and so that's really the approach that we, we try to have. And to do that, of course, we need to work with partners, um, finding the right partners that, that have a bit the same DNA, so very agile, very open, very digital, of course. So that, that's why uh, ImaWeb was, was a perfect partner for us. And um, yeah, and my employer would be uh, angry if I didn't mention that, that CSR is, is a very important topic uh, for us as well in innovation. So um, yeah, so you know, in a couple of weeks, we launched the uh, Keep and Green. So it's, a, it's an investment product um, only with uh, sustainable funds. So just to say, it's an important aspect also of things that we try to, to pay attention to that. So say thank you for both of you and uh, congrats also for the partnership. You still want? I would just like to add one word because again, my employer would not be very happy either. Um, I just wanted to say that the um, simulator that you see, the calculator that you see online today, uh, is really just the beginning, and it's going to be much more integrated and offer much more features um, uh, that will actually not just be a simulator on a platform. It will be really uh, completely integrated. Uh, we will also offer um, uh, advice and physical uh, advice to physical network of brokers. Um, we'll partner soon with Imotaker for that aspect, because not, unfortunately not everyone is ready yet to take deep uh, online. Um, and then Imo will keep innovating not only in the financial sectors but in other aspects. So keep an eye open. Great information. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will leave uh, the floor to uh, to Idris now. And uh, regarding the rent to buy model, maybe we can speak about this uh, afterwards during the networking. <laughs>
but uh, yeah, it works, but it, it's too small. So if you don't mind, I will myself uh, manage the slides and you can just me, you can just tell me next. Because okay, but, okay, good. Let's go for it. So hold on one sec. So I'll start. So um, thank you for this introduction. Also, Idris, uh, I'm uh, leading the the large refurbishments and developments, as well as the technical due diligence for uh, Allianz Real Estate in in West Europe. Um, and I'm also very happy to work on strategic topics like digitalization, sustainability, and data asset management uh, again within my teams. So um, additionally to that, as you know, uh, at Allianz Real Estate, we don't have a a dedicated full-time team for innovation and digitalization. So I'm, I'm very proud to lead the, the current PMO project management uh, innovation and digital for Allianz Real Estate, where more than 20 people across the organization are working on very interesting uh, projects in the field of innovation and digital. So um, you asked me also to say a couple of words about Allianz Real Estate. Yes, please. Uh, we do we do, do do you handle the slides or it's me uh, Indres? so who's managing no, it? Maybe you're in the second slide yeah. i'm i'm there okay good so uh alliance real estate is the strategic real estate organization within the alliance group i'm sure that you all know alliance group and uh, i'm sure that you have also insurances there um which is great i invite you to do so so i'm part i'm proud to be part of the largest investor uh, with over 81 billion of assets under management so on behalf of 38 alliant uh, client and my 440 colleagues are spread uh, um, in between uh, 19 offices to close the globe um, so on the slide three we see uh, how the central functions of ARA are organized so they're based in munich um, but also in Paris, and uh, you see that we have a very strong uh, central organization, but also very strong local presence, which is a specificity for, for Allianz Real Estate. Uh, and this is also how we run our uh, strategic project on innovation in digital. So we run it centrally, but based on the entire power that we have uh, from our uh, local excellence in terms of investment and asset management. Indres? Yes. Is it here? Speaking <laughs> about uh, innovation, could you could you a bit uh, deep dive into your innovation strategy? Do you have a specific strategy? Do you have a specific innovation focus? Maybe if you could present some of the use case of innovation. Are you still there? Did I say a word that? Uh, Innovation, maybe? Okay, apparently that. Turn that, okay. I'm back. Okay, yeah, yeah, I thought you were allergic to the word innovation. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> am I, am so I back on the stage? That's your innovation strategy. You Good, thank you. So, um, RS Global Portfolio uh, Digitalization and Innovation Strategy revolves around two fundamental goals. So on one side, as you see here, we have a, a, a target for portfolio value maximization. I remind that we are investor and asset manager. So we look for new, value, new venues for value creation, like new asset classes, products, and services. Uh, we are concentrated on customer centricity. We would like to make sure that we provide the best in class user experience across our buildings and portfolio. And finally, we want to make sure that our buildings are operated in a very optimized way. So on the other hand, we need to make sure that we are achieving our ambitious targets on ESG performance and carbon neutrality. Um, and to accomplish these both objectives of portfolio value maximization and pursuing a green agenda, um, this will require to handle two kind of strategies in the same time. So on one side, a top-down approach, and on the other hand, a bottom-up approach. If you go on the next slide, you will see very exactly, very precisely how we do that. So uh, on the top-down side, on the corporate level, we have defined a couple of solutions that needs to be, um, that are common for the entire organization uh, and uh, that are shared by the entire um, crew. So it's basically about an IPMS solution, integrated property management solution, portfolio management solution. It's about the global accounting tool, that we all share, uh, and uh, also uh, something which is uh, 
that I will present today our data asset management, which um, is concentrating the entire building operation data into one very big data lake. So this is our top-down approach. At the same time, um, as we are global, we need to know what's going on on the different assets and what's coming from our different locations. So therefore, we systematically ask our um, our local asset management investment teams to bring up some um, some some local best practices. Um, and for instance, uh, every time when we need to uh, when we can collect some data from the buildings, we don't hesitate to do that. Every time when we need to to refurbish a building, we have a common standard that allows us to to develop smart products across all our geographies. And finally, when we buy a building, we also um, put the necessary capex in our business plan to make sure that we can we will have uh, by when something is entering when a building is entering into our portfolio that it's already smart digital and uh, cutting edge in terms of product. Thank you. And you you basically mentioned a number of times data and we think that data is the new oil. Um, so could you present us a concrete use case on how you can leverage on data to create value? Mm -hmm. If you go on the next slide, you will see the, uh, the one of our major um, programs that we're currently running. It's called the Building Signature Program. So this is our asset digitalization, um, uh, asset digitalization strategy. Uh, the goal of this digitalization program is to catch the value generated by smart buildings. Um, and uh, it's basically, uh, we believe, I believe also, that uh, we're in a historical moment for the real estate where um, we are uh, switching from real estate products from bricks and mortar to something which is uh, what we call what we can call a product providing superior tenant experience uh, this the moment is historical because we see at the same time three big changes as you can see on this slide on one side we have the smart building infrastructure on the top of the triangle um, that means that instead of having classical building components like classical door, uh, today uh, the market is beating connected doors. So um, we are moving from classical components, building components, to connected building components. On the other hand, on the right side, you see the smart tenant use. Imagine you have, a, 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 I'm giving you iPhone 11, but you want only to use your phone to make calls. In this case, I'm selling you, uh, I'm giving you a phone which is very expensive for the use that you want to do. So what we observe now is that the tenant is starting to use in a smart way the smart component in a building. And the third change, the third disruptive change, perhaps the most disruptive one, is that today we have an entire ecosystem of smart operations. So we have a full ecosystem of smart partners that are deploying digital services. Uh, and we saw that also on uh, on the on the PropTech challenge uh, last week, how many great solutions and how uh, uh, many ecosystems are getting around. So all these three paradigms, uh, building building infrastructure, the way how the tenant is using the building, and the way how the building is operated, uh, this is today possible because we have one we 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 have now the missing component in the middle, which is the data, the data and the exchangeable data between the different stakeholders and partners. This is what allows us today to come to this disruptive place where we are transforming the classical real estate into something completely uh, new that didn't exist uh, until now. Okay, understand better. Can you maybe present this finally? Uh, excellent. So, uh, if you move to the uh, to, to to the next slide, um, you will see uh, uh, <clears throat> you will see uh, one of the examples of the of the services to tenants that that I'm mentioning. Imagine for a second you are you work in an office building and you invite three external partners to your to your building. So, after one click uh, of your phone, uh, your partners receive an invitation code. And with this QR code, they can enter the building without any kind of complexity. The artificial intelligence of the building is then selecting the most adapted meeting rooms across the meeting rooms in the building, is giving an instruction to the HVAC to cool the room, to prepare to the right temperature, to ventilate so that you can enter the room with the best and optimal comfort. So this is what I call the obstacle-free um, uh, user experience. And as a user, you don't need to think about any of those topics technically you just need to make sure that this experience for you 
is provided. And this is what we are tackling very precisely uh, at Allianz Real Estate. This is answering our challenges for energy savings because uh, HVAC is optimized and is tackling also our, um, our uh, willingness to give more services to the tenants uh, in, across our portfolio. On the next slide, you will see how do we cluster and how do we um, manage uh, all these um, uh, all these use cases. So we have defined more than 30 use cases, uh, and with those 30 use cases that we have regrouped into uh, six categories, we want to make sure that our buildings are completely uh, responding to the needs of the tenants. Uh, the topics you see them by your own. So it's about health and well-being. It's about productivity. The example that I gave with the space usage but also about security and also about sustainability. So no one wants to work in a building that is consuming too much energy or in a building that it's not safe for the health of the people that are working inside. So to make it very precise on the next slide, you see uh, uh, exactly how do we deploy this program. Uh, and here I want to say that one of the largest challenges today for the, for the real estate industry in terms of innovation and digital is just to make it happen. You can see a lot of people talking about great solutions, uh, great ideas, but uh, this is not the, the, the hard part. The hard part is whenever you need to deploy. And at Allianz, since one year, we are deploying this program. We're deploying the entire technology and we're deploying the full set of services in 10 assets across our portfolio in Europe, which makes more than 500,000 square meters of assets that will be completely fully digitalized and that will provide the top level of services to the tenants. Where we currently stand is that we are making now the construction works, uh, we are making the, the additional on top of what we already have to make sure that all the services are correctly provided to, uh, to our tenants. So I think that this is a differentiation factor between, um, it's a kind of strong power of Allianz to make things happen and not only to speak about. So our profile, just to revert quickly to the previous presentation, our, prof, uh, our profile is also on a smart follower. So we are, not, we are not disruptive in what we do, but we want to make sure that we are excellent in our core uh, activities and typically providing the services to the tenants uh, and being excellent in dust management is among our core activities. That, therefore, we do this smart and digital program. Understood. Um, and you spoke about the tenants, so let's uh, let's uh, get your views on this. Uh, do you think that the COVID-19, I mean, what, what is the impact of the COVID-19 on your uh, business? And do you think it has changed uh, the needs of the end users, the needs of the tenants, maybe forever? Mm -hmm. um, if you could quickly move to the next slide, you will see that the office of tomorrow, um, I think, will make the people more productive and will make the people, let's say, happier in uh, whenever they are. So uh, the office of tomorrow um, will definitely create uh, a working environment that is safe. I think, especially in the COVID situation, the first thing that you think, if I go to the office, am I safe there? So being making the office safe means air quality control and people density measurement. You need to know how many people are systematically in the office and how does it work um, uh, exactly. Um, the COVID will also shift the way that uh, we understand the work from home. So by accepting and supporting uh, the employees to work from home, uh, this is definitely part, part of the office of the future. Um, and we need to think about the focus on productivity versus the physical presence in the office. Do you need to go to the office to be productive? Um, and finally, we need to make the office more like feeling home. Uh, the office today in a lot of places is just a sterile, sterile place where you don't feel, you don't feel good. And we need to make sure that tomorrow you're motivated to go to the office and the office is delivering amenities that improve and simplify the life of people. Um, to sum up, I think that we, we're in a situation where um, there are two big categories that you see also on the slide. Um, you have uh, situation A, big cities, uh, where the density is so high that the office will definitely continue to be used exactly in the same way as they have been used yesterday. Uh, and today, and you have then cities that are with low density, where commuting to the place is taking a lot of a lot of time. You need to spend a lot of time in the transport, and I think that those cities with low density will have a different, uh, let's say, future regarding uh, the office uh, the office spaces. And in the big cities where the office space is re is, is still attractive, 
we definitely need to rethink uh, what is the office of tomorrow with the two hypotheses that you see on this slide, making the office more collaborative uh, or adding more uh, more services so that the people are really, again, uh, happy and feeling better there. This is clear. Um, one of the big questions I saw would like to ask you, maybe as a math question or an opening question, is whether your views in relation that race recovery should have with the technology giants, the GAFA, that are more and more entering construction and real estate, should they partner us? Should they copy them? Should they ignore them? Uh, should they, yeah. <clears throat> um, it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, to be honest with you, I would have asked them the same. What do you think about Allianz entering into the technology market? Um, so uh, on one side, uh, I believe again that the future of real estate is linked to the user centricity. Uh, and we need to make sure that uh, as, as owner and landlord, we're providing those services again to the tenants. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not my core business to provide those services in, in the execution. Uh, so uh, we are already partnering without uh, giving the name of one of the companies that you're mentioning. We are already partnering very extensively to see how can our entire portfolio will be covered and what can we do to make sure that um, that the tenant is um, is capturing from the value of digitalization. Um, so I think that uh, the, the GAFA, uh, the big players, uh, from my perspective, I see them rather as a partner um, and we, I, I don't think that we can some, we can be beaten in our core business, uh, but it's part uh, and same for them. So I don't think that we will try to enter into their business in terms of uh, uh, gathering the entire data of the planet. Uh, our uh, main main scope is to make sure that we 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 keep the contact and we keep uh, the building operating co correctly. So I see the GAFA rather as a as a partner. Uh, I see them as um, as, um, as as a service provider also. Uh, and I'll be very happy to know how do, what did they think about Allianz entering into the technology market, yes. My name is Elena, and I am the founder. So, well, let me start with five years ago. Me and my co-founder, Axel, uh, our studies at uh, Antwerp Management School. We were studying a man and innovation and entrepreneurship. And what was very uh, nice and what was very cool during the study is that we got the opportunity to think for six months if we would start a business, what we would do. And for us, it was very important that it would solve uh, or that it would help to solve certain societal problems. That's on the fact that, of course, it needs to make money, but it's a turnover. Otherwise, it's not a good idea. And we found three major problems, and uh, uh, the thing that they all had in common was this. But the first new societal challenge that we identified was the rate of urbanization. Um, I think everyone maybe has heard figures about this before, but there are 2.5 billion people moving from rural areas to cities in the next 30 years, which is crazy. So it's 30% of the world population is going to move. Um, these 2.5 billion people will only need a new roof above their heads, so we are going to build around 1 billion new homes. Uh, mostly apartments in 30 years' time. This is probably going to be the biggest uh, construction boom in the, uh, the history of human life. Also, a lot of studies are indicating that the world population will top around 10 billion around 2050. So, we will be building a lot in the next 30 years. Uh, in Belgium, we saw that this is also very, very much uh, the case. So, uh, City uh, has started shortage of affordable houses. And then, so for example, we, we also know this is happening in the UK, but we also saw that there are tens of thousands of people moving to the city center in the next 10 years as well. Um, and that's why we're also the environment being changed. We are going up um, because of the, the market space. The second thing that we saw was the increase in cost price. In 20 years' time, the cost of construction has risen around 75%. When we saw these trends, Excel and I concluded, all right, the construction market is going to change. If it doesn't change, we screwed, basically. Um, and what we learned in our studies uh, and recent conversations is that uh, the power of change is not going to work. Um, 
Um, we came up with a product called SAM on the Smart Adaptive Module. And what is SAM? It's basically a modular uh, furniture piece that includes all your utilities. So your bathroom is in, the, your, your, is in there, your kitchen is in there, your heating is in there, your ventilation is in there. And what the biggest technological innovation, what we achieved was that we were able to include all wiring in the uh, lower 15 centimeters of a closet. So any, yeah, if you have a closet, you know, there's this uh, sets on a, on a sockle. I don't know how you say that in English. Um, yeah, uh, and we put everything in there. So no longer in the in the concrete, no more in the structure, anything in the lower 15 centimeters and in the top 15 centimeters. So all heating, all ventilation, uh, wiring, all electricity, all sanitation appliances, all heating and ventilation appliances, all electricity, the lights can come out of it and all uh, communication uh, wiring as well. So main question, why would you do this? Why would you build with SAM? Because we saw that this would make uh, the construction, the part of the utilities, at least for sure, uh, drastically more affordable. So up to 30% in comparison with traditional uh, building systems, because it goes way quicker. There is way less hassle on site. Uh, everything is fully BIM ready. Uh, it's one party that uh, manages the entire installation process. Um, you get closets instead of deep rock walls, which cost equally as much we saw. And with the way that we do them, they're also acoustically perfectly fine. Um, and yeah, especially if you're going to go scale this industrially, this, the price is just going to go down and down and down because you can introduce standardization and, and so on. And on top of it, we also saw it's a very efficient way of dividing uh, an apartment. Um, everything is centralized. You create a lot of living space, and yeah, the story of your your your, uh, your a lot of space is getting used by technical appliances. It also it's also gone because everything is in closets. Um, and then on top of it, it's a way more environmentally friendly way of installing. So we can save up to four tons of CO two in comparison with traditional way of installing, which is the same amount of uh, emissions that a regular car does in Belgium on a year. Okay. Thank you, very clear. Um, speaking about the, uh, the modularity and the prefab, do you think, how is it on the market? Do, is it a, a must have or it's just still a nice to have? Are there many companies doing this as well? Good question. Um, yeah, so yeah, we, we, um, we follow this up quite closely. Um, I think when we started five years ago and I would walk into someone's office, a uh, uh, developer, and I said, hey, modular construction, they looked at me like, okay, yeah, yeah, just go back home. Um, but now the market is completely changing. Uh, we see that it's going quite quickly um, uh, in Belgium as well, but also on an international level. Uh, I think maybe mostly of, maybe a lot of you have already heard about Sidewalk Labs, the Baltic company of Google, um, and they are developing the, first, or they were developing the first Google city in Toronto. Um, this project got cancelled, but they're go, they're, you now hear rumors that they're going to do it somewhere else, and they have already invested billions in it. So yeah, I think it's definitely going to be uh, realized, but it's going to take a while. But this is how it was going to look. So fully uh, cross-laminated timber built towers, um, all productified, standardized. Um, yeah, the, the picture speaks for themselves. Um, it's a completely different way of building for sure, but if you just look at the simplicity of the designs, I think it's going to result in a huge cost savings. Um, and it was already mentioned, the, the big Silicon Valley, uh, Silicon Valley players are, are very much entering the market. Um, they are very public with their research, which is great. Uh, I don't know if they're still available, but they have six big manuals that you can download on the website. And they just very, very clearly communicate how they look at, at the, the opportunity here. And they basically see six core components for a building and they design it out. And yeah, the, the figures speak for themselves. Uh, it's like 75% uh, less, let me see, what is it? Uh, fewer components and 80%, 85% fewer trucks. So, and it's just, it's on and on and on with these crazy figures. Um, 
also in Europe, uh, IKEA. Uh, they of course created quite a quite a uh, switch in the furniture market. They now also for quite a while have been building buildings uh, from 1996, um, and they have built uh, 11,000 homes up to date. So that's around 3.5 homes a day. Um, it's not very well known because you don't find a lot about it online, um, but they are very much still active. Um, yeah, they, it's mostly in the Norwegian countries, but they're moving south, uh, England. They're already having some projects. Um, and um, yeah, they, they're going full steam ahead. Um, I can maybe show a little movie. I don't know if that's going to work. Maybe skip it. Yeah, a bit challenging. OK, um, another example is Catega. Uh, um, this is, for us as a business, this is, I think, uh, the most promising one of them all um, because it's yeah, they just go really fast. It's a, truly an American uh, venture-backed business. They have raised $4 billion up to date. Um, they have built 16 factories in four years' time. They have an order book of uh, $3 billion, 700 projects. They're going to completely, fully, vertically integrate the construction market. So as a developer, for now, a developer, you go to them. They have architects. They design a building. The architects, they are in direct contact with their factories. Their factory produces everything, and their own people are going to install it on site. So it's a fully closed closed loop, and I think that's uh, where we are heading. Um, and they are going yeah, insanely quickly. And then in Belgium, of course, we also have a couple of great examples. Skillpot, um, they are uh, they are also going really hard. Um, just did another uh, funding round. They're, I think, market leader, modular construction in, in Belgium. Uh, and then Michiel's Building Solutions, another example, um, also uh, going very, very quickly. Little box for the utilities. And then uh, in all our modesty, we put ourselves uh, in that category as well. Um, but we are still quite small. Maybe, um, or just one last question. Um, you, you are more focused on the residential uh, class, but also you are expanding uh, to the Netherlands. So what are your next steps? Do, are you going to go um, further into other asset classes or and are you going further abroad? What are the next steps? Um, yeah, so maybe the first question, why residential? Um, because yeah, as I started my, my presentation, we just believe there is the biggest challenge. Um, as I mentioned, 2.5 billion people moving to cities in 30 years. Um, something needs to happen or, uh, or it's going to be a huge, huge problem. Um, and we think that why, why wasn't prefab uh, implemented in the residential market sooner? We thought when we did that study is because there is a lack of modularity. So our competition are prefab bathroom units, basically. That's, I think, the product that's, that's closest to the SAM. But it's always the same fixed design. Um, and what we this what we what was very important for us is that with what we developed that it's that it's modular. So um, as a, in a residential project, the end user wants to have a certain amount of choices. Not everything can be or should be the same, but at the same time, it can't be too complex. So we look at it from a really modular way. So SAM is basically for now 35 different elements. Um, and we have written down all software last year. Uh, and now if we get if we get plans from architects, last year we we use our own software to to draw in a SAM. But then after a year, we were like, okay, this works. Maybe we should make it publicly available. And then we made a simplified version and we put it online. And now we get uh, designs from architects and developers from all over the world that use our configurator, which is a SketchUp plugin, to make their own SAMs. Um, and I think that's a very interesting way to look at it because it's still standardized. It's still very modular, but on a component level. And that's the way we believe you can scale these type of solutions. Um, because it also means that you can easily adjust the same product for a whole different wide range of different residential markets. So student homes, uh, holiday homes, uh, service flats, reconversion of office space to apartments. Uh, we think definitely during and after Corona, this could be interesting. Uh, loft renovation or renovation in general, and then just city-based living. Uh, it's all possible because of the modular approach that we that we have taken with uh, with the SAM. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So how we look at the future? Um, we are, as you said, we are now having our first international project in the beginning of twenty twenty one. Um, but yeah, on a product level, our, our roadmap, um, we are gonna quite strongly invest in the further digitization of the customer journey of of Sam. So that a customer from home can decide which sink he wants, which color of finishing he wants, instead of going to six different shops on every Saturday, we need to choose out of thousands of options. Um, and I think, yeah, that's not optimal, we think today. Um, and now we are already starting with research into energy monitoring and services for the SAM product itself. Um, we are now doing, a, together with Flux50, some research on it. And we, uh, we're gonna be working on it next year as well. Um, but the digital customer journey we're going to hopefully launch next year. And then further in the future, we think, and I'm, I'm not saying we're going to develop these all ourselves, but we look uh, to, a, to a building as a, basically a couple of combinations of, of, of products. Um, and the way that we look at it now, it's basically three more products and you have a building. Uh, a modular technical shaft, same story, fully digitally for, uh, developed. Uh, produced in an automated factory, installed really quickly on site. Uh, same for the utilities, uh, modular utilities, uh, same design methodology linked to the two other, like a SAM and a modular technical shaft. And then if you combine that with a prefabricated uh, structure, a cross laminated timber or um, a, a, a concrete prefab structure, or yeah, there are many options today. Um, but if you combine these different product lines, the especially from a design perspective, we think you can drastically simplify the entire process. Um, and, and yeah, we would like to play a, a role uh, in that future. That's basically our, uh, our goal. Um, well, thank you. Thanks to you, very inspiring. Yes, yeah, so the, the question, uh, what's the biggest challenge that we have today? Um, I don't know where to start. <laughs> As always, there are many, many challenges. Um, yeah, I would say industrialization. We're quite ambitious uh, from the beginning. I mean, ambitious, we, we have a quite strict vision, uh, quite well-defined why. But if you want to do this well and you want to do this properly, you need to industrialize and, scale. yeah, scale. And that's a very specific amount of knowledge that you need to be able to build up and get the time to build up internally or attract from outside. But this is not something that's very broadly available in Belgium. And those profiles are very expensive. So we need to have all the time to project by project learn and skill all the processes, but that takes time and time is money. Or we need to be able to attract the right amount of knowledge quickly enough into the business, but that asks money. And yeah, and a lot of, yeah, that's, I think that's the biggest challenge that we have now. Um, but we are now finishing up a, a new funding round. So hopefully that's done quickly. And then we can, uh, we have two, two and a half years to uh, really kick ass again. Um, yeah. <laughs>
uh, housing factory. Uh, the baseline that we use is thuis komen das bostoen, or in French, bien chez vous avec du mat. Uh, my role in the company as uh, head of sales of mar and marketing, I'm responsible for product development. Yeah, thank you. Grab you the mic. Um, so uh, I think Bostoon was amongst the earlier adopter of technology uh, as a real estate developer in Belgium, and especially for marketing reasons. So can you maybe explain this a bit more? Idris, I was expecting that question. <laughs> so uh, we don't use technology as a gimmick uh, these days. Uh, we uh, really use it to serve people, to help people, to make their lives a little bit uh, more easier. Uh, for people to seek their new home or an investment project. Secondly, as uh, our building materials that we use aren't exclusive at all, uh, it's a way to differentiate from competition. And that is why we invested a lot in virtual reality and augmented reality with the uh, housing configurators. And of course, last but not least, to achieve our commercial objectives, uh, which are sell more, sell faster, more lucrative, and then with an amazing uh, customer experience. Excellent. Well, um, I usually ask what are the big uh, trends that are shaping uh, real estate and construction, but let me maybe reframe a bit slightly different. Uh, what are the big trends that are shaping technology and impacting real estate? So what are the trends in, techno in the technological world that are, that, having, that are having an impact on real estate? Excellent question. So although we are living in a VUCA environment, VUCA stands for, everybody knows, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. There's a lot of unknown unknowns at the moment. Although we are uh, facing some uh, emergent technologies, uh, first of all, uh, you have to pay attention to artificial intelligence. There's a lot of data. We speak about big data. We need artificial intelligence to capture that data, to analyze that data and to have what we call a proactive uh, way of living. Secondly, robots. Uh, the big advantage of robots is uh, they eliminate as much as error as possible, but the biggest problem is they're not consuming anything. Then there are drones, drone technology. We use uh, a lot of drones uh, at, uh, at uh, Boston Group. Uh, first of all, to inspect the building sites, but also to monitor the evolution of them. Virtual reality, um, as a RED company, uh, we are obliged to sell 30 to 40% in advance on plan. So we uh, have the difficult task to, ask to, to, to sell real estate without having a physical building. So we find some way or the other to let's say, give the customers uh, a good side of uh, their new home. Then there is augmented reality, which I will explain later. Blockchain, of course, to avoid um, the different middlemen. Uh, Internet of Things, IoT, it's also uh, an important uh, new technology, a smart building uh, as well uh, that uh, we are using on um, uh, different projects uh, at Bostoon and Jumat at the time. And uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, 3D uh, printing of houses, but I am a fan of 3D printing of different elements which can be used in uh, housing. And on top of that, I would like to add biotechnology. Here you see a picture of biotechnology. We bring living organisms here in concrete, self-healing concrete, but there is also a system of Saint-Gobain with uh, self-cleaning glass, um, CO2, uh, CO2 reducing uh, pavement and uh, things like that. Thank you. So we uh, built at PropTech Lab a sort of module to analyze the innovation maturity of real estate corporates. The first are the, the beginners, I would say. They have 0% uh, budget to invest, uh, to, to, yeah, to invest in innovation. They don't have one uh, full-time equivalent working on innovation. They don't have a clear innovation focus. They don't have a clear vision of innovation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's the beginner. And then you have the uh, pioneer, investing more than one percent uh, in R and D innovation, etc., uh, etc. Et so my question would be: When is the right time to start innovating? And with what can you start? Um, and uh, what are the technology you could easily deploy? 
my recommendation is uh, don't wait till the next big thing. Uh, just start today or start tomorrow. Get started um, because the uh, world and the environment is uh, evolving very rapidly. Although the construction industry is uh, and real estate business is rather conservative, uh, don't try to be the fastest snail. Uh, look around you, look to other industries, learn from them, and uh, do what needs to be done considering the society as a whole. And like I, I like to use this picture of the Sagrada Familia and to explain uh, to the people slow architecture. Uh, so try to imagine the future, build something, start, evolve, but keep up the dynamics. Uh, and of course, uh, keep in mind that there will be temporarily hurdles as well. Or like this funny guy once said, imagination is more important than knowledge. This funny guy. Well, um, of course, at Boston Group, you as well deploy a lot of VR and a lot of uh, AR. Um, and can you maybe go a bit deeper with your vision on that? What is your ambition? Uh, how how are you using these technologies specifically? One of the uh, marketing technologies that we use uh, since um, three years now uh, is uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, you know that there are three different types of the reality. You have this physical reality, uh, which can be lived remotely, like we are doing with the uh, online audiences. Uh, we have this augmented reality, which is the exact same physical reality, but with a digital layer on top of it. And everybody, I'm sure, will remember uh, the uh, Pokemon hunt where children look walk around like zombies searching for these uh, Pokemon characters. And then you have the fully uh, artificial world, which is the virtual reality with here, the GTA game um, as an example. Uh, OK, that was your answer. OK, so maybe, yes, please. Maybe if we if you could go a bit deeper on, on that topic. Yeah, I thought you had a second question, another question, sorry. So why do we use these different uh, realities uh, at Boston Group? Well, first of all, to uh, disconnect from time and space. We have a lot of customers seeking for our products when we are not at the office. We see that uh, sometimes in the evening or during the holidays, people are looking for a new home or, no, or, or an investment project. We are not there. So we try to help them and to be available 24-7. Uh, which is efficient and, of course, in this COVID-19 times, very safe because they can do it from whatever they want. Then secondly, to build trust, because what you see is what you will get. We try to create a fully artificial uh, truth of what is going to be built in the future. So just imagine that you can walk around in your new home, uh, configuring different types of walls and floors and uh, sanitary uh, equipment without having a physical building already existing. And of course, to add uh, value, because as I said, uh, building materials are not exclusive, but the way that we approach the customer, the way that we guide the customer through is uh, best uh, imaginable solution makes a difference today. So I have uh, three different uh, examples. Uh, this is an example uh, of uh, 300, uh, three, 360 degree uh, photography that we use for our uh, existing real estate projects. Uh, the technology that we use here uh, comes from one of the uh, PropTech uh, members, uh, which is uh, Noodle View. So all what is uh, demo houses, demo apartments are 360 uh, degree ready. Another technology is what we see here, the uh, virtual reality with the home configurator. I hope that the movie will work. Can I start it? Yeah. We made a small video to demonstrate it. Here we go. So this is the uh, online version, but we also uh, have a more static version in the headquarters and in all of our demo houses. So from the website, you can click on an apartment or a dwelling of your choice. You go further on and here you can see the inside. This is 
100% virtual reality. You can click in dollhouse mode or you can see the floor plan. You can walk through the apartment as we see here. And then you have the possibility, of course, to uh, click on some finishing material that you would like to change. Here, as an example, we can change the color of the walls to create your own look and feel. But it goes further on. You have all the uh, sanitary devices or you have the pavement that you can uh, choose as well. The technology is also available on mobile. Your smartphone, of course, is rather small if you look at it like that. So all the different possibilities in flooring, as you see here as an example, are programmed in a sort of database. You can click on them and in real time, you see uh, the look and feel changing. This technology is made by our friends uh, from uh, Prompto around media, uh, who helped us uh, develop, oh, I see a lot of colleagues, who helped us develop uh, this technology it was very important for me and for the company to have this on a mobile version because we see that a lot of uh, people are looking around and uh, going to see our job sites without our knowledge. So from a distance, you can even look inside uh, the different houses. I go on with the next video, if it is possible. Yes. Here uh, we made another video on the application augmented reality. Why? Because uh, one quarter of our marketing budget still goes to print advertisement. But we have a big problem with print advertisement. There is no uh, experience because it's a static uh, picture, visual, and there are no metrics. So I don't know who have seen the advertisement and what is the next action that people take about it. So if you hover over the uh, advertisement, you get a 3D uh, view of the building, which I will show you right now to make it more clear for you. So you take one of the print advertisements. We have the application downloadable in different stores. And then you see a pop-up of the uh, 3D model of the building. Then you can look inside to have, let's say, a first impression of what it is inside. This is a teasing video, it goes further on. And what's important for us is that from the print advertisement, you can click through directly to our website. And on our website, you can make an appointment with one of our sales reps to visit on site. You have one question for me? Uh, yes, uh, actually, um, I think this is very important. Um, we think that the, one of the most impacting, I mean, one of the strongest, strongest trends, sorry, hard to say, one of the strongest trends in residential real estate is the fact that um, the customer experience will be the main differentiator from the competition. In other words, it, it's not the quality of the project or the quality or the pricing of the project that will be a differentiator from the competition, but the quality of the uh, customer experience. And it starts, of course, with the first touch points in, in, and in sales. So I think these kind of solutions, for me, it's really a, a strategic dif differentiator. Um, but my question would be, um, what's the cost of this? Because we often hear, uh, yeah, deploying these 3D models is good, but it costs too much. And we can do this only uh, on the latest project, uh, I mean, on the latest units that we, uh, that, we, that we will sell because we already have profitability and we cannot decrease the margin or this kind of topic. What would be your answer there? Of course, it costs a lot of money, but uh, what's the value of money? I think that if you want to position your brand as one of the leading brands in innovation, you have to invest, you have to invest in the future, you have to make yourself different uh, from all other competitors. Uh, bear in mind that we have 1% market share. We sell an, on average uh, 400 uh, units, but we only have 1% market share. 
So this is this means that we have a very diffuse market uh, in this. Uh, of course, we invest a lot of uh, innovation because we believe in innovation. Um, we finance the development of new technologies, and I'm fully aware of that. Uh, I'm fully aware that a part of my marketing budget goes to development costs that uh, the technology companies, startups and scale-ups then can reuse or resell to one of my competitors. But mm, I always want to be the first one to use it. And if I have one or two years advance on the market, that's the one year that I've won. And I know that uh, this isn't a commercial presentation, but uh, I would like to make some uh, advertisement on a book that I'm writing together with uh, my boss, my great boss, Johan de Vlieger, and a brother in arms about this uh, innovation, about this new technology, about the frustrations that we have in R&D, in real estate, in construction, about the legislation, about our vision of the future. And uh, we bundled that in a, the approximate 250 uh, page book, which will be very interactive. We will put a lot of new technology on paper, let's say in this. Uh, the book will be uh, released uh, by the end of this year during winter time and uh, bear our uh, socials and uh, website in mind. We will publish a lot of information gradually uh, towards the uh, uh, release that will come. So it goes about the uh, impact of uh, time and space on the residential uh, project development. Thank you. Uh, hello. Victor Sago, I worked uh, until very recently for Proximus, so I know uh, Johan and we have already met. Um, now I work for uh, Jacobs, which is, let's say, uh, uh, a, a company that does installments of fiber and other smart devices on public and private space. And um, inspired by your book, um, you say 250 pages. Um, can you tell a little bit more? Because I cannot imagine that it will be limited to the, the, the few catchy slides you just presented. What is the conclusion? Where is the, why should we buy it? Speak about your secrets. Well, I first need to sell my book uh, to you. So, um, uh, yeah. No, um, this is not a commercial uh, event, let us say. So uh, we are not taking the money. The uh, money goes to a fund, a child fund. So uh, it's not uh, lucrative. Uh, you know that uh, Johan and me, we are not always uh, on spot when we buy land, uh, when we develop, when we uh, drive for permits, we are not always there. And uh, we would like to distribute our view on the future of you on the market within this book. So we have a lot of conclusions, but this book is also the beginning for us. We would like to open the debate to uh, government, uh, to lawyers, to different landowners, to competitors, to try to, together with us, imagine a future, imagine the technology, imagine prop tech, and uh, that will be our challenge with this. If I can add something, we deeply believe at PropTech Lab that uh, innovation is a, a collective sport uh, that we can win only in ecosystem. Um, and we think that if the real estate market doesn't advance, it will be percuted or it will be um, yeah, it will be kicked or hit by another market, probably the technological market. Uh, they will have the data, and uh, the developers will be just kind of service providers and they will they will uh, lot and they will lose a lot of added value they will have a smaller margin and so i'm completely agree uh, i do completely agree with your approach maybe one last question because we're still waiting for chris the next speaker to join online ah, is there okay so if ever you want another question uh, it's now i guess uh, it was a great presentation thank you, thank you very much we have the chance to have Chris Rice here 
uh, online. And we also have Martin Skow uh, physically here. I don't know if um, he was here for, for an interview just uh, before. Uh, but Chris is uh, actually in Oslo. So um, he couldn't make it to Brussels, unfortunately, but technology is amazing. So uh, hi, Chris. Let's okay. start. And uh, thank you for being there, Chris. It's great to have you. Maybe you can introduce yourself and uh, and we would be glad to hear more about the story of Unlock. Maybe share a bit uh, what, what pain points you are resolving about the business plan. You can go ahead. From North Cape in Norway. As you can see on the picture here, it's, uh, it's a really cold place, a lot of snow and the mountains. And this is where I was born. And uh, it's a really, really dismal, cold place. And I, I remember when I was about six or seven years old, my, my mother introduced me to the internet because she bought a computer. And uh, I remember just being really obsessed with this thing, wanting to learn everything and just seeing how you can build things in the digital space. And I guess some of you might recognize this picture, which is uh, uh, Tetris in uh, MS-DOS in like 94 or 95, I think. I remember I, I played this game every day for like months just trying to understand and trying to perfect it. Uh, and uh, as I grew older, I really wanted to try and understand how can you build something like this? So I deep dived into the computer, all the hardware and also the digital, trying to build things like this on my own. So that's kind of my background. Uh, but today I want to talk more with you about, okay, what about prop tech and uh, what am I doing in this space? And also I'll share uh, some stories from, from my company that I've built uh, starting three years ago and also introduce you to my colleague who is with you, Martin, uh, in a few seconds. So what we are seeing here, I'm hoping you can see my slides. Uh, I might just increase this a little bit for you guys. Maybe that helps a little bit, but I'll try to talk through the slides. So what we are seeing now these days is that some mega trends are driving really, really change into the prop tech or, or the real estate industry. So for once we have this sharing economy going on, as you know, with Airbnb and WeWork and other types of services that forces buildings to be used much more dynamically. A lot of people are entering and leaving buildings much more often than before. And we also have a lot of services going on, like cleaning services, janitor services, and type of delivery services. And of course, online shopping, which is this massive growth in the last years. Uh, and the common denominator here is that people have to have access to the buildings. So, but there's not really been much innovation in the access space, uh, but there are things happening. Uh, but the thing is, of course, that uh, we expect things to just be working really, really easily. So we expect technology to be seamless and super user-friendly because we're used to paying with bank cards. We're actually used to even paying with our phones now these days. And we're used to like controlling our house and our lights, our heat, everything through our phone, just kind of talking to our phone and things just happen. You're just Googling everything. You know, everything is just so seamless through a phone. But what we noticed uh, is that the access control space in buildings is just really outdated. And actually, it kind of looks like this. I've been trying to illustrate how it seems. So there's all of these different systems out there which are super outdated and really proprietary. And it's just this huge map of fragmented solutions that you have to uh, understand and use, especially if you're working across different buildings. There are all these different systems. But still, we're seeing that this access, access control is growing rapidly. So it's a lot of investments going into these technologies. And there's a lot of acquisitions and people are actually buying a lot of access solutions these days and it's expected to grow uh, i would say insanely the next years but i think what what we're really missing out is like these guys ourselves the people the users we are actually the ones who want a good solution something easy and it's all about technology it's all about this ai big data all these buzzwords right so i i really want to do something simple and i like technology to to attend to my needs, uh, not the other way around. And that's also the reason why we started a new company three years ago. So I'll talk a bit about that as well now. Uh, and the company is named Unlock. And our vision is to open doors for everyone everywhere. 
And I'll try to show you a small video just about how easy it can be just using your phone to open up a key and then just easily getting access through a building or a door. And that's kind of the core idea behind what we wanted to build. Just really using what you already have in your pocket, your phone, and then allowing the technology to easily use without you having to interfere with like these super complex things. So that's what we decided to build is like this world's digital keychain where we collect all the different keys working with all these different systems. But for the end user, it's just one thing, one simple solution that works with every door, regardless of what type of hardware or access control system there is. And just to brag a little bit, we were just three employees two years ago. Now we're already at 30 employees. And I'm not sure how well you can see the slide, but, but this is a slide of all the faces in my team. But there's one missing in the middle. And that's what I wanted to emphasize on today with you guys uh, announcing uh, exclusively for you that we're actually opening a new office, our first subsidiary. So today we are announcing our country manager, Martin, who will be leading Unlock Benelux. So I'm hoping you guys, especially locally, are able to also meet with him to talk more about uh, this idea of trying to open up this fragmented space of this really old, outdated uh, proprietary solutions. And, and what we want to do and what you also, what we want you to join in on is, is this, trying to be an enabler, trying to open up things and collaborate much more so that everything can be better, so that everyone, people can move around in a much better way. So that's kind of my message. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to opening discussions on this thing. Thank you. There is a bit of echo when I am talking. But the question we have is that you are gathering a lot of data and uh, we want to know if like all the users, they have access to this data. Uh, and have you ever been cyber attacked or is there, is there a risk? Mm, good question. I think with, with all types of software, there's always a risk of being hacked. So what we really focused on is to always... Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. OK. Yeah, so I was just uh, mentioning that, that I think everything can be hacked. Uh, and that's also our idea, that we, we build software and we know it's hackable. So we always try to, to uh, put in place the most modern uh, uh, solutions for preventing that and also adding more steps. So, so we're learning from especially the banking industry, seeing what type of crypto they're using to prevent uh, intrusion and just really keeping on top of that and of course we're really thankful to be working with also the security industry with these access solutions and they're really on top of security so they're they're teaching us a lot of these things okay thanks also um regarding the the fact that today with the the offices we speak more and more about short term about flexibility how does it impact actually this um, this access control in general? So, sorry, your question was uh, how this like short term flexibility uh, affects access control. Yes. So, uh, how uh, the flexibility, how the nowadays expectations of the end user are having an impact on the on this on the access control. Yeah, yeah. I think that's actually a really great point. So, so what we've seen like the last years is that we're used to our physical keys, our key cards, and these key fobs, all these like plastic things, uh, which are great if you have them with you. Uh, and of course, if you're a permanent employee or at your residency at home, it works fine. But when we're going into this new phase with these trends where people are much more sharing space, and we, we tend to have, like, a, like you mentioned, a high flexibility and really low uh, periods or, or short periods where you want to enter things, we always have to kind of pick up this key somewhere and always remember to bring it back to the receptionists. And of course, imagine all the different keys that's everywhere. It's really hard to manage. So that's why I think going into this digital access space is so important to really enable people to move around much more easily. And uh, what about, um, here we speak about uh, the buildings uh, for the access control, but. What role could the access control maybe play in another sector or on something else? That's, that's actually 
tapping into the idea we started with in Unlock as well. So we actually started in a whole, completely different space. Um, initially, we were just noticing that a lot of people complained about this online shopping, which I didn't really understand, right? Because online shopping is so, so convenient. It's so easy to find everything and to pay for it just with like a simple tap. But there's still like this huge friction point, which is you still have to get these things delivered. And I guess you've all experienced like this kind of house arrest where you have to wait for like hours where the delivery person says, well, I'll be at a place like in between 8 and 12. And they're like, am I, am I going to really take off time from work and stay at home for hours waiting for this guy <laughs> in 2020? Uh, so that's actually an industry I think we can really impact, which is like the logistics and mobility of uh, service providers. And not just for delivering packages, but also services like elderly care and cleaning services. They spend a lot of time just trying to negotiate a time window where we're actually available. And uh, of course, if, if you could easily just share a key with their phone, they can access your uh, the, the, whichever place they need to go to uh, really seamlessly. So I think that's a new space we're really going to see a lot of change. Okay. And maybe uh, one, uh, one last question. You announced the expansion of the team, of course, but also that uh, you have a fundraising. You are busy with the fundraising of 2.3 million. Uh, what are the next targets, actually, with that? Yeah, so, so we actually raised uh, quite some capital for like half a year ago. And up until now, I think we raised about $4 million. And during the next couple of years, we'll be raising uh, tens of millions of dollars more to keep growing the team, keep growing this open technology that everyone can can easily use. So we will expand quite heavily internationally. But uh, yeah, first steps is to Europe, and Benelux office is kind of our our uh, how do you say it? Our flagship uh, expansion. Yes, indeed, you are a member for a very short time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so um, maybe we can um, go to Q and A. Do any one of you have some questions? Any questions for Unlock for Chris? Or maybe you were very very clear. <laughs> and um, sorry to tell, but maybe everyone has the need of having a beer also now. I hope you have one as well. <laughs> If uh, no one has a question, then thank you very much, Chris. We look forward to see you in uh, Brussels. Huh? Thank you. Thank you. I hope you could hear the applause. Yes, <laughs> thank thanks. you and enjoy your beer as well in Oslo. Maybe one last word for the online audience. Uh, you have the networking features as well, so you can uh, explore the kind of uh, professional chat roulette uh, feature on the tab that you have on the um, on the left uh, side. So go uh, over there and uh, engage with people, identify synergies, collaborations, etc. And for the online audience, uh, thank you for joining. It's now uh, time to have the friendship drink. And thanks a lot to all the team of PropTech Lab who worked uh, quite hard to uh, to organize this. And of course, to Work Hero. Uh, and we have the back office team. Thank you very much and uh, to work hero for hosting the event. Thank you.